Hi, I'm Mary Pohl, your host for the Sales Mastery Summit. Tell me, do you introduce yourself first when you're meeting a new prospect for the first time on the phone? If so, you're doing it wrong. Today's expert knows how to eliminate rejection from the prospecting process, first by getting rid of dumb mistakes and then by using smart calling techniques. With me today is Art Sobchak, author of Smart Calling, Eliminate Fear, Failure, and Rejection from Cold Calling. Welcome, Art. Thanks, Mary. Great to be here. Likewise, thanks for joining us. Hey, before we dive into smart calling techniques, can you share with us some of the mistakes that sales reps typically make that lead to the rejection that we're all so worried about? Well, there are so many. I will start with the main ones. Okay. Probably it would be starting out by talking about themselves and their product and not focusing on the prospect. It's pretty simple, but yet if it's so simple, I wonder why people continue to do it all the time. For example, using my business, if I called up and said, hi, I'm Art Subcheck with Business by Phone. We're a sales training and prospecting company. I've been around for 30 years. Matter of fact, I just won a Lifetime Achievement Award from an association. And I'd like to talk to you about what we do. Yeah. So, Good for you. That, yeah. That is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and click is what we normally hear at the other end of the line. Or I'm not interested. Uh, we're all set. We don't need anything. So that's one mistake. Another variation of that mistake, of course, is not having any value for the prospect at the other end of the line in addition to just talking about ourselves. Uh, another major one, which caused me to, to write the book that I'll get into, and that is not knowing anything or using any information that we have about the prospect to separate ourselves from every other prospector or salesperson out there. Uh, there are a number of others. Let me just give you a, another major one that is very typical with salespeople, and that is asking for some type of decision or even intimating the fact that you're going to ask for a decision or even do business with the prospect. For example, hi Mary, Art Subcheck here with Business by Phone. I would like to come out there, take about 15 minutes of your time and tell you what we do. Now, it's way too early to ask for a decision. We haven't even earned the right to stay on the phone with them for 15 seconds longer. Why in the world would they want to even meet with us? So another major mistake, you mentioned right at the beginning in your, in your introduction, do you introduce yourself at the beginning of a call? Well, so many people will call up a prospect and say, hi, Art Subcheck here with Business by Phone. I'm just calling to introduce myself. Well, big deal. This is not a cocktail party. We're there, hopefully, to present some type of possible value to them. So we want to get into that very quickly. And really, that's all they're interested in. Fabulous. So it sounds to me that it's a comfort level that um, sales reps go into talking about themselves because that's what they're comfortable with at the beginning. So I'd imagine that you really help them build a comfort level um, with doing what's right, a better approach. Well, part of the reason that salespeople hate to prospect is that there are so many myths regarding prospecting, and that is you, you should love rejection. Well, of course, I'm no Dr. Phil, but if I love something, I want to get more of it, right? <laughs> so, yeah, we want to help them build a comfort level with prospecting. Yeah, cold calling is dead is a mantra that's being perpetuated by a lot of people out there. I'll agree with the cold part, but not the prospecting part. Prospecting is the fastest and cheapest way to enter into a sales conversation and therefore, of course, consummate a sale with somebody. Because I could do it right now by just picking up my phone, getting somebody on, on the line, and maybe get a credit card for something within a matter of minutes. But again, you got to be comfortable doing that. And if somebody is continually being shot down as a result of what they're saying, yeah, of course, they're going to shy away from it. They'll find something else to do. Maybe go check Facebook or send out some tweets. <laughs> yeah, avoidance and procrastination. So um, we've all heard that sales is a numbers game, which means that you're going to be rejected more than you're going to be accepted. So how is it that you can eliminate rejection? Well, there's a difference between rejection and resistance. I'll talk about rejection here in a little bit, but rejection is not what happens to you. It's the way you define what happens to you. Now, resistance, getting resistance is inevitable in sales. 
we're always going to get resistance, just like a basketball player will miss shots, baseball players will swing and miss, occasionally accountants won't have their numbers add up. But none of that is rejection. It was just something that didn't work at that point. But how, what we do is help them minimize the resistance that they're getting on their calls by simply doing the right things and avoiding the things that cause resistance that, again, so many salespeople commit these errors every single day because either they've heard other salespeople do it, so they think that's the right way to do it, or they've not been taught the right things by managers who are focusing on everything but the nuts and bolts and the art and science of the message. What do we say in order to get to a decision maker? And then what do we say once we have them on the phone? And that's what I focus on. Okay. Well, let's start off then. What is the right thing to say to avoid resistance when we're first meeting a prospect on the phone? Do you want me to go through the entire process or should I just give you an example first and then break um, Why it don't down? we start with the example and then if you would share the process. Okay. Well, for example, let's say I'll take my business and I would call, get a VP of sales or a sales manager on the phone, introduce myself and say, hi, this is our subject with business by phone. In speaking with some of your sales reps, I understand that there's a big push for generating new business from new customers within your sales organization, but yet there's been a little bit of pushback because the sales reps are reluctant to place those prospecting calls. Worked with a number of other companies in that same situation and helped them to dramatically increase their number of new accounts while also helping sales reps be more comfortable with the entire prospecting process. I'd like to ask you a few questions, see if I can provide you some information. Okay, I like that. So you started off with really emphasizing that you knew a potential problem that they're dealing with and you fixed that problem for others. So you referenced that you know how to deal with it and the fact that you could do that for them. So rather than having to care about you and your awards, I can care about what you can do for me. Exactly right. And, and you just broke down the process there in, in, in so many words. That, that's what we're doing. I knew something about them. I used that information. So immediately I separated myself from every other salesperson. I didn't even say, if you notice, hey, I'm a sales training company. I want to talk about a workshop. I want to talk about a webinar, a seminar, sell you books, audios, videos. People can resist the thing. Okay, People can resist the thing. It's a lot more difficult for them to resist the result. So what I also did there is that I made it very conversational. And as you mentioned, I related it to their situation. I understand this is what your initiative is. This is a problem you're experiencing. This is what we've done for other people. And notice at the end, I didn't say I want to come out there and, uh, or anything that I wanted to do. I wanted to make it as non-objectionable as possible, which was, I'd like to ask you a few questions, see if I could provide you some information. I also like that um, your approach didn't sound manipulative, that you were getting the prospect to state the obvious back to you and kind of walk into, um, you know, the next step. You, it, it was very respectful. You didn't say, you know, do you have an interest in getting rid of uh, rejection in your own prospecting, which what else could they possibly answer? It, you know, you, you, it wasn't manipulative how you shared it. Yeah, that, and that, that's a mistake too, sounding salesy. Uh, for example, the old, uh, Mary, if I could show you a way how you could get more business and avoid rejection, of course you'd want that, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. And I think some of that's still being taught out there, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get them to agree to the obvious, right? Right. So you said... Um, that you've got a process that works when you first meet and then basically keeps you flowing through your sales process in a smart calling way. So um, assuming that we got in the door now and got past that initial resistance, now um, do you have a process that takes us the next step to avoid the resistance in actually getting to a decision? Well, yeah, and really it all has to start prior to the phone call. So we, do you want me to go through those steps? Yeah. What, how we really make the call smart? Well, the, the first step in the process, and, and let me define what smart calling is. Smart calling is very simply knowing something about the people and the organizations and the industries that we're calling into, what's going on in their world that might make them 
interested or might make them a, a good prospect for what I have. So, and of course, we all would rather talk to somebody who knows something about us as opposed to the, the salesperson who's smiling and dialing and everybody's getting the same pitch. A smart call would be like getting a handwritten note as opposed to a stock direct mail piece that's, that's addressed to occupant. Okay, so there's the analogy there. So it's all about, it's all about marrying. It's not like I am making this call to a hundred other people. So how does that that start? Well, number one, we have to sit down and 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 by the way, so much sales training is based on here are our products, here are our features, here are our benefits. And I was just reviewing a sales training manual from a from a client the other day, and the first several hundred pages was about just product. And my suggestion is let's have buyer training. Let's understand who are the people that we're talking to, what's going on in their world, what, it's the old saying, what causes them pain, what keeps them up at night. I don't like asking that question for somebody because it's, it, it's so trite. But by the way, we do, we do want to know that. And what would, why in the world would they be interested in, in what I have? So we really have to define that. And by the way, we want to define that on all the different levels that we're talking to. Because, of course, uh, well, depending on what, what people are selling, you might have uh, the, the user buyers, and we've got all the names for this, right? You've got somebody who's using your product or service. They're going to be very interested in things different than the C-level who might just be interested in the return on investment or the bottom line. So we need to do that analysis. Then what we want to do is, of course, define our possible value proposition. Some people call this the, the elevator speech or just the value prop. I like to call it the possible value proposition because we don't know for sure if they're going to be interested in what we have. We might have a pretty good idea. And, and by the way, you just don't want to say we help companies save time and money because everybody says that, right? Get more specific with that. What we do is we help reduce the time that it takes somebody to perform normal functions in their auditing process, okay? And the more you can quantify that, the better. All right. So then, and I'm really fast forwarding through, through, through the whole process here, then we want to gather some information. And what's really great about the environment that we're living in today, as opposed to when I started in corporate sales 30 years ago, is that back in the day, we had to go through directories and go to the libraries, where today, with a couple of keystrokes, I can find, find out tremendous amounts of information, more information than I'm going to need or use about prospects. And then what I'm going to do is take that process one step further to get even more information about my, my prospect. And I do this through a process called social engineering. Social engineering was or is a, a process that computer hackers actually use to get information, to steal identities, to hack into uh, computer systems and phone systems. And what they do is they use the weakest link in any company security system, which is or are the people. And they simply call into an organization and ask questions. Well, we're doing it for good purposes because we're doing it to help our prospects. Now, social engineering is simply calling into an organization and asking questions of anyone that we can talk to. For example, in my case, a great place to call into is the sales department because we all know they like to talk, right? So I'll call into the sales department and I'll introduce myself and I'll let them know that I'm not a prospect for you, but what I have may be of some potential value or you may be affected by it. And I'd like to ask you a few questions. And what I do is ask them questions about their sales process, their training. Do they do any prospecting? Is their training any good? What kind of results do they get? What do they wish they could have that would make them better prospectors? What kind of problems are they running into? What kind of initiatives do they have? And now, I have all this information when I call up a VP of sales because I've been talking to their own salespeople. Now, some people who object to this might say, well, geez, they won't answer those questions. Well, a self-limiting belief here 
is that people will not answer questions. And if anybody makes an assumption of what they can't get, they're always going to be right because they simply won't ask the questions. So trust me on this, everybody out there, if you follow that process, ask for help, identify yourself, and ask, or give a justification statement, by the way. That's the real key to this. Justification is simply giving a reason for why you want the information. So what I'll say is, I'm going to be speaking with your VP of sales. I want to make sure I'm prepared when I do. I'd like to ask you a few questions. So there's a justification. Then we ask the questions. So now I'm, I'm prepared with all this information. And by the way, online information, there's services out there. For example, Inside View, great service. Google is one of your greatest sales assistants in the world. If you use Google News Alerts or Google Reader, you can set up keywords and Google will notify you about some trigger events that might be going on in your prospects world or they'll identify prospects for you. Okay, so doing a lot of talking here, let's talk about the actual smart calling process. How do we, how do we say something that's going to be of interest or some value? And by the way, what I'm going to present here is a simple four-step process that is for creating interest when we have a decision maker on the phone or for a great voicemail message. People ask me all the time, what do I say on voicemail? And my answer to that is exactly the same thing or almost exactly the same thing I would say when I have a decision maker on the phone. So here we go. Everybody get your pens and papers out. Step number one, pretty easy. Identify yourself and your organization. Hi, this is Art Subject with Business by Phone. I like to use first name and last name. Now, as far as your delivery, be careful about saying it too quickly. We're so familiar with who we are and who we're with that we say, all right, time to show business by phone. <laughs> and we just throw it up. So say it slowly. Step number two, use your smart call intelligence. It's here where we make a connection. And then also, I call it the separation statement. We're separating ourselves from all the salespeople who called before you and all the salespeople who will be calling after you because you're going to know something about them. And it could be as simple as congratulations on being awarded the new contract I just read about in the business journal. Or in speaking with your maintenance manager, I understand an issue that you're now facing is in talking to one of your salespeople or I was reading your company blog, or I saw on your company Facebook page, I noticed in one of your tweets that, okay, boy, I never thought I'd say tweet. Anyway, <laughs> so we have the, the connection. We're letting them know that we're, again, we know something about them, and they're not really expecting that. And now what, we, what we've done is we've, we've earned the right to take a little bit more of their time because we, we still have them. Now, we, what we don't want to do here is just take up space with something inane like, I know you're busy, so I won't take up much of your time. Well, if you know they're busy, why don't you just use 15 words to take up some of their time? Okay? <laughs> so we don't want to use any of those things. We immediately want to get into the meat of this. Step number three after the connection and the smart call intelligence is we're going to relate or hint at, notice I said hint at, our possible value proposition. What we have been able to do with other companies similar to yours is, okay, what we specialize in is working with CFOs who are facing the dilemma of and we have helped them too. So you want to use here what's called social proof. Social proof is what you've done for somebody else. It's proven. They really can't argue with it. You talk about results here, not the product or service. People can resist the thing. They really can't resist the possible result. And then finally, step number four is pile on a little bit more value and then get them to the questions. You want to get them talking as quickly as possible. You might say, and we've been able to repeat those results with 25 other organizations in your industry. And I'd simply like to ask you a few questions, see if I could provide you with some information. I love to end the calls with to see if I could provide you some information. It's very non-threatening. Notice I didn't say I want to set an appointment. I want to schedule a webinar. I want to meet with you. I want to become one of your vendors. No. No, it's too early for those type of decisions. We want to make it as non-objectionable as possible. And here is the reaction that I want when I'm done with all of that. Here's what everything should lead up to. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah, 
What do you want to know? I just want to buy or earn the right to get a few more minutes of their time so I can begin asking some questions. And now what I'm going to do is be prepared with questions that will help me get them thinking about the possible pains or problems or concerns or desires that I may be able to do something about. Now, your objective of your call will really dictate how far do I want to go with my questions before I make the recommendation, which is the next part of the call. For example, I'm working with an organization right now where their main objective is to set appointments so they can get in front of qualified and interested decision makers. That's going to be a much shorter call than somebody who is solely on the inside and they're selling enterprise level software. Their main objective of this call might be to get interest, get agreement that yes, they will go through a web demo with you. Okay, so I want to I want to create questions where I work backwards from the results of my product or service. So again, I can get them thinking, get them in this right frame of mind where they're going to be more accepting of my recommendation for the next step. So I always tell salespeople what we are really, Mary, is that we're in the state of mind business. We're first trying to get somebody in a positive, receptive state of mind. Then we want to move them more into a state of mind where they're thinking that. Okay, well, yeah, there, there might be something here. I might be interested in, in taking a look at how you might be able to help our sales organization. And once I have them in that state of mind, then they'll be more, again, receptive to, to hearing a recommendation on the, or for the next step. Fabulous. Okay. So I have step one is to slowly identify yourself and your company and then move into displaying that you know something about them by using your smart call intelligence that you've done. And then you get to the meat by hinting at um, problems that you've solved that you're assuming that they have for other companies just like them. And then pile on the social proof by saying, and we've done this for many companies like yours. And then you said get into asking a couple of questions to set up basically the next step is to see if they're interested in more information, further dialogue with you. Do you have any suggestions on those further questions, how to open that door to, I guess, that probing or interaction with them? Yeah, what I'm interested what I suggest is, and, and we go through this in training and actually takes several hours, is that you want to start out with the big, broad, general questions. So if you picture an inverted pyramid, we want to start with the big, broad, general questions and then focus more down to the specific. And actually, we go through an exercise where I have sales reps take their possible forms of value, their, their results, and then we define what would make that uh, of value to somebody? What would they have to be experiencing? What would be going on in their world that would make that a benefit? And then we create a question to determine does that exist in, in their world? So for example, a, a benefit of what I deliver is that it makes salespeople more comfortable picking up the phone and making prospecting calls. <clears throat> so the middle column in, in our workshop activity would be, why would that be a benefit to someone? Well, there'd be several possible reasons why. Number one, salespeople are just not placing enough prospecting calls now because they're afraid of the resistance. Also, they're not placing enough calls now because they just don't know what to say. So my first big, broad, general question might be, well, tell me about the emphasis on prospecting that you have in your organization. Now, I want to be prepared for whatever way the answer is going to go. And, and that's really the key for being smooth as a salesperson. We all know where we're going to go if they say, oh, our prospecting stinks and we're really looking for a training program right now. Oh, really? Well, let me tell you what I have. <laughs> so I want to be prepared for the person that says, well, you know, we're, we're just doing okay with prospecting. So I want to dig a little bit deeper there. I might say, well, we're just doing okay. Well, well tell me, um, do they have a quota? Uh, do they have a new business? Uh, do you have a new business initiative where they have to bring in X amount of business? And how are they reaching that? And really what I want them, I want to guide them to the point where they're telling me that, well, they really need to be better at it. Oh, well, why aren't they good at it now? Well, they're just not comfortable with what they're saying. 
Oh, well, what are they saying? Well, they're saying a lot of things that's causing resistance right at the beginning of the call. Oh, can you give me some examples of that? And then I want to dig deeper and say, so you, you believe then that that's probably the main reason why they're reluctant to pick up the phone and ultimately that's resulting in <laughs> not as much new business as you need. Is that right? So you can see now where I've asked a series of questions where I got them to tell me what was in that middle column, which then means that my benefits and results will be of some interest to them. Now, I may not jump in at that point because now I have that one in my back pocket. So I'm going to go to my next line of questioning, whatever that might be for this particular prospect. So, you know, you really can't script out an entire call. I do firmly believe that you have to script out your opening statement and your voicemail message. One of my favorite sayings is the absolute worst time to think of what you're going to say is as it's coming out of your mouth. <laughs> so when you're totally prepared with what you're going to say at the beginning, now we don't have to focus on, oh my gosh, what am I going to say next? Now I'm ready for their response and where am I going to go with the question? Now we can't script out the entire all the, the line of questioning, but I can be ready for where am I going to go regardless of what they throw at me. And again, all great salespeople do that. Nobody wings it. Now there might be people with a lot of experience, but what that experience means is that they probably have it up here, so it is scripted in their mind. But for people just getting into this, it's, it's work. It takes a process. What we do is we go through the work so we can sound unscripted on our calls. Okay. So I like that because in the questioning process, it sounds like you actually are helping the prospect to get clear for themselves what their real hottest needs are, um, which they may not have thought about before. Um, so you're really, I guess, helping them live that and appreciate where their greatest pain is. And it also gives you a chance to feel out of all the value you could provide. What do you want to narrow in on or hone in on? that really matches up best with that particular prospect. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. We, we want to help them reach the conclusion on their own. A lot of different names for this is Socratic selling. And to me, the, the, the greatest sale is when someone does something that I'd like them to do, but they feel like it was their idea to begin with. And that is really the ultimate. Let's face it, nobody wants to be pitched at and part of the reason why all of us have built-in sales resistance is that we want to make the decision. So if we can help people think that, yeah, I, I, I do have this problem. I've been looking for a solution. This is one possible option. Yeah, that, that's, um, that, that's worth considering. That's, and it's very conversational, very soft sell. And the salesperson likes it. The prospect likes it. Everybody wins. Fabulous. I also like the... Um state of mind reference that you made that really someone could plan their selling process to that first you need to get somebody in a positive mind state and then get them curious open up their mind which then makes them open to trying something new or accepting a suggestion that you'd make yeah it's it reminds me of the the salesperson had uh, went up to a sales manager and said, boss, I can lead them to water, but I can't make them drink. And he said, your job isn't to make them do anything. It's just help them realize they're thirsty. And that's what we're doing. Perfect. Perfect. Art, is there somewhere some um, our viewers could go if they wanted to dive in deeper on smart calling techniques? Well, yeah, the, certainly you can you can get the book. <laughs> I don't even personally sell the book. It's it's available through our website. Go through a special link on our site, which is business by phone, business by phone dot com, and you go through a link there. There's a number of bonuses that you'll receive for for getting the book. Amazon actually uh, discounts it, so it you can get the the e version for, for practically nothing. It, it pains me. But, <laughs> and also, I've got a couple other uh, free things as far as resources that your viewers can take advantage of. One that we, we used to sell, and actually we still will sell as a, as a hard copy book, is, is now an ebook, and it's called Telephone Tips That Sell, 501 How-To Ideas and Affirmations to Help You Get More Business by Phone. And there actually are over 500 brief little tips here. Matter of fact, I had a guy just contact me yesterday. He bought a bunch for a sales staff and he's had it for, for a few years. And, and uh, But 
we've decided we're going to give this this away free. Now, a little bit more on the smart calling as well. I've, at the home page, I've got a special report that I give away, which is the top 10 dumb cold calling mistakes made by salespeople and what you can do to, to avoid them. And I guarantee, and these are in addition to opening statement mistakes. So both of those are free right at the home page of our site. Again, that's businessbyphone.com. And then also we've got free weekly tips that, that we email as well. And those have been going out for about 15 years or so. So you can see, uh, you can see an archive of some of the back issues. So a lot of free stuff. Okay, well, thanks so much for that. Can you tell me what um, gets you really excited about the impact that you see um, with clients that start using smart calling techniques? Well, you know, I've, I've been in business a long time, 29 years as of this month, and it, it's always gratifying when a, a salesperson will tell me the the impact that I've had on their their sales life as well as their as their income, which translates, of course, into into their personal life. And what's really cool is that it it, it happens both with people who are new to sales. I had an 18 year old just out of high school who contacted me a couple weeks ago and he told me he came into an organization where he was of course the, the youngest guy there. There were all these veterans that were in their late twenties and, and early thirties and they were telling him that oh cold calling doesn't work and, and you've got to do tweeting and Facebooking and social media and all this and he thought well that's that's ridiculous. I want to get good as fast as I can. He said he picked up a copy of the book and he started getting through to, to high level decision makers getting into sales processes very quickly and blowing away some of these veterans just simply as a result of doing the things that they said he couldn't do. He just went out and did it and he was very comfortable doing it. And he was perhaps just naive enough to not know what he couldn't do. Uh, conversely, I had a guy who was older than me, which is old, and he had made a lot of money in commercial insurance. He had a commercial insurance brokerage. Well, through some misfortune, he lost everything. He almost filed bankruptcy and he's now building up a, another business. And he told me he built up his original business by cold calling back in the day, but he forgot how to do it and he knew those techniques didn't work anymore. He picked up a copy of the book and he's completely changed the way he was doing things and now is enjoying great success just simply as a result of following the principle. So it's things like that that are that are really gratifying. I love too that you emphasized, you know, even veterans love, need to evolve and upskill because what used to work is not necessarily what works today. Well, you know, the way I look at sales, Mary, is that, and I run into sales organizations where a manager might tell me, well, you know, Joe over here, he's been around for 25 years and, you know, he's, he's, he's a veteran. And I'm thinking years of attendance don't necessarily mean years of experience. And I wish I would have come up with that quote. I stole it from somebody I don't know who, but, but it really is true. And I know personally, if I'm not learning something new every day, I'm sliding downhill. And the same thing is true with every great salesperson. I've never been around a superstar salesperson who's making the big money that didn't have a priority to continually learn and get better. So you're right. The, and in many cases, the more experienced salespeople are the ones that, that need to get themselves on a self-development program. And of course, anybody who's watching this probably doesn't apply to them because they, they realize how important it is to invest in themselves and programs like this. Exactly. So as people are beginning to adopt smart calling techniques, where do they get tripped up? Where do they get stuck in the conversion process, if you will? Well, I'd say they get tripped up it, just like with any other process, not following the process. If I go out to the golf course and I'm not following the, the good swing process, I'm going to lift up my head. I'm going to uh, probably try to watch the ball. I'm not going to follow through. And uh, occasionally somebody might think that, oh, well, I don't need to have a good value proposition or they know us, they know our company, they know what we can, can do for them, uh, as opposed to following the recipe. If you try to bake a cake and you leave something out, you're not gonna get the result. 
So follow the process. And it's really, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. It's common sense, but it does involve some work. But just like anything, you're going to get a return on your investment. Are there any um, checkpoints you can re recommend or a way that somebody could um, evaluate or catch themselves, whether they're straying from the process or if they're right on? Are there kind of process checks besides somebody hanging up the phone on you? Well, yeah, I, I would want to make sure that you, if, if I have to give one piece of advice to anybody out there, that is record yourself, okay. record your calls, and then go back and listen and evaluate. You're going to improve in two areas. Number one, you're going to improve the way you sound. Let's face it, most people, when they hear themselves on a recording, don't like the way they sound. But the good news is it's easier to, way, to change the way you sound than it is the way you look. There's no exercise or diet or, or surgery involved. So by listening to yourself, normally that makes us a little bit uncomfortable and it'll help us pinpoint where we want to change. The other way it's going to help us is that it's going to allow us in non-real time, because we're listening to a recording of ourselves, right, to evaluate did we do everything that we should have done on this call? Was, did, did I have a good introduction? Did I have a good connection with my smart call intelligence? How was my possible value proposition? Did I engage them at the end by moving them into the questioning phase of the call? And let's say we did get some resistance at the end. I'm all set, we don't need anything, we're, we're, we're not interested. At that point, what we wanna do, get this, is almost ignore what they just said because that's not a real objection at this point. So at that point, it's not the optimal point to be, but we don't want to give up yet. Too many salespeople will say, oh, okay, well, thank you, keep us in mind. Instead, what we want to do is get them talking. And I might say, oh, I understand. So, so tell me, do you have an emphasis on prospecting now in your, in your sales group? <laughs> now, if you notice, I just pretty much ignored what they just said. Now, is that going to work? Sometimes it will. It's a lot better than saying, okay, keep us in mind and, and leaving. Because now, if they answer the question, I've accomplished really the objective, part of the objective of my opening, which is to get them to the questioning phase of the call. I may not have them yet in the positive receptive state of mind, but I'll work on that through the question. Okay. I like that. The um, opportunity to reflect on what you have done as well, because as you said, nothing is perfectly scripted because there's two players involved. And um, so as you're responding on the fly to what's happening on that call or in that meeting, it gives you a chance to go back and say, is there a better way I could have handled that? So it's learning real time. Well, I always tell salespeople in training, here's how you can get a graduate degree in, in sales, okay? Ask yourself two questions after every single call. And you can do this whether you're on the phone or even face-to-face, -face, whether it's a prospecting call or a regular call. Ask yourself two questions. Number one, what did I like about that call? What gets rewarded gets repeated, right? Even if we're rewarding ourselves, pat yourself on the back. And the other question is, this is where the real learning takes place, what would I have done differently if I had the opportunity? Now notice that's not a dis destructive question, which is what didn't I like about that call? It's what would I have done differently if I had the opportunity or what will I do differently next time? And if I guarantee if you do that after every single call, you're going to get that graduate degree relatively quickly because again, we don't learn from an activity while we're engaged in it. We learn afterwards when we take the time to reflect on it and break down the film. Exactly. I love that. Art, do you have any um, final words of advice for our viewers that are getting started with smart calling? Yeah, make the call. Make the call. How, how simple is that? Too many times salespeople will think that I've got to get involved with all these other peripheral activities and I got to send out a thousand emails and again the, the tweets and the social media. Hey, that's great. Those things are all marketing and they can perhaps pave the way for a better call. They may even generate some leads for you. And hey, who wouldn't rather call a lead than somebody you haven't spoken with before? But too many times, somebody will sit down and try to craft out an email as opposed to just picking up the phone and making contact with someone. Calling still does work, 
for people who have something of interest and something of value and if they do it in a smart way where they're connecting with an individual as opposed to just throwing stuff up against the wall to names on a list. So when in doubt, make the call. People are getting rich off of prospecting, despite what some people might say that prospecting doesn't work. Yeah. If, if somebody thinks that, just go talk to somebody that's making a lot of money doing it. If you, have, this, if you can't find them, contact me. I'll put you in contact. Fabulous. And in this day, prospecting does not equal cold calling if you use social engineering and smart calling techniques. Absolutely. Cold calling is dumb. Cold calling is dumb, which I define as calling somebody you don't know who doesn't know you, that you know nothing about, saying the same thing that you're saying to everybody on your list. That is dumb. That is a cold call. Smart call, as we've just illustrated, is the way to go, and it does work. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Art, for helping us all avoid the fear and rejection in our selling process, and also for giving us the tools so that we can make smart calls going forward. And Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in and investing in your own success. The Sales Mastery Summit is here to help you never stop learning from the best. Take care.